Support Wrestle Talk. Give us a subscribe. Ah, uh, fuck. fuck. How do I? This is going to make so many horrible people cross. Every single takeover has at least one match of the year candidate on it. Some of the greatest emotional moments in that brand's history come from cards that weren't quite as good. How do I? What is the criteria? F I almost thought it might be wrong to actually even make this list, considering that as of recording, it doesn't seem like Takeover Tampa is even going ahead. Hey, Editor Rich, is Takeover Tampa going ahead by the time you edit this? Thanks, mate. Then I thought, you know what? F that. Let's make it because this list is all about celebrating what is taken all together, for my taste, the best wrestling product ever created in the history of mankind. It's not just moves, it's emotional endurance, sharply focused character-based storytelling, intricately designed spectacle from the greatest physical performers to lace their boots. It finally legitimized Western women's wrestling in the mainstream. It's got some of the best tag wrestling in the business today. It's created some of the best long-term slow burn storytelling ever. It's the the best of the indies, the best of WWE, all wrapped up in a sequence of shows that are epic without being five fucking hours long. Where the hell do I start? It's the 10 greatest NXT takeovers of all time. Honorable mention, our evolution, because I have to and I've only got 10. Sami Zayn spends over a year toiling and sweating and redempting his way to the top of the NXT mountain, and it's a beautiful moment when he finally wins the title. He has the chance to cheat, but does it his way and makes it on his own as Sami Zayn, unique, wonderful babyface before being no scope by his best friend who's just debuted that night. The undercard isn't as strong so I can't officially include it, but this payoff, this triumph, this tragedy represents everything the first era of NXT was and effectively saw NXT start the climb towards the peak of their first golden era. So let's kick off the list properly. Number 10, TakeOver Rival. So when we're looking at NXT, especially in terms of TakeOver, there are roughly three main eras. The Zayn era, the Rude era, and the DIY era, or Gold, Silver, and Platinum, respectively. If you leave this list feeling like the Zayn era is underrepresented, I understand. Some of NXT's greatest moments exist in that era. American Alpha catching fire, the banks Bailey Iron Man match, Becky Lynch finally putting all the pieces together, the Enzo and Cass actually being good, but it was also still a developmental brand. There were indie megastars, but also like Bull Dempsey was there. That's not a dig at Dempsey, but the early takeovers were a true mix of skill levels because that was the point of NXT. Showcase these guys. However, even back then, some cards were still fantastic. Case in point, takeover rival. Not only was the undercard stacked, Hideo Itami versus Tyler Breeze over delivered. We had the first and still somehow only fatal four way, including the four horsewomen of NXT, and Neville versus Finn Balor was a solid match of the year candidate, but the main event was the first step in one of the best rivalries of the decade, Zayn versus Owens. The video package is one of the best NXT ever did, and the match itself was a masterpiece of simple but unexpected booking. Zayn mistimes a leap to the outside, cracks his head, then Owens just power bombs him over and over and over until the ref stops the match. Zayn loses nothing because he wasn't even pinned. Owens is turned into an even more loathsome monster, and Zayn's title reign ends after just a month with neither the champion or the championship suffering. This match proved that NXT knew how to reward its fans for their emotional investment. Just a stellar damn night of wrestling, and this list is only just getting started. Number nine, TakeOver Portland. Right now, NXT feels like it's approaching the very end of a special time in its life, almost approaching critical mass. One of Gargano and Ciampa is likely to leave the company at the next TakeOver, and the reign of the undisputed era seems to be crumbling too. And yesteryear, this would mean that we're about to see a raft of very important call-ups, necessitating a massive shift in the roster, and a period of calm that sees less spectacle and more a bit of patience character building. NXT's existence as a third brand, however, throws that tradition into uncertainty, but it definitely feels like they're ramping up to a finale because, goddamn, this is NXT almost at a point of self-parody. Every match is so much. Lee Dijakovic is the pinnacle of Hoss wrestling, and honestly, though, will Keith Lee marry me, please? The undercard also features Bianca Belair heartbreakingly becoming a superstar right when Charlotte decides to visit, which is dreadful timing. Gargano and Balor being everything we needed while also featuring Balor pinning Johnny with his fucking dick, and the bros awaits being very dumb and very, very good. The only thing that really lets this card down, and this is obviously subjective, is that NXT has almost come too far in its delivery of its main events. Portland represents the latest in a string of mains that stretch belief to its breaking point, and then DDT belief 
teeth on some concrete and then believe kicks out a few more times. Depends how much Ring of Honor you like in your gumbo. But yeah, this feels like a final inhuman sprint towards Tampa where everyone will explode in a Crisis on Infinite Earth style event and then maybe things can calm down just a smidge. You know, if Tampa actually happens. I've made myself sad. Number eight, TakeOver Philadelphia. If there's one man that's become synonymous with TakeOver, that man would be Johnny Gargano. What would happen if a meerkat put on beef and became the greatest set-piece wrestler in the world? Since the days of Gargano tagging with Ciampa as DIY, we knew he was an exceptional wrestler, but it wasn't until TakeOver Philadelphia with his insane match with Andrade that we knew he was the next top star of the industry. It was the first one-on-one -on -one TakeOver match to go over 30 minutes. The Iron Man match went exactly 30 minutes. Don't you at me now. It was the first NXT match to receive five stars from Dave Meltzer, if that's something you care about, and it set a new standard for TakeOver Maine, something which perhaps they've tried a bit too hard sometimes to replicate. It's amazing. Watch it again. And while the undercard is not the greatest of all time, there's still some very strong stuff here. AOP versus Undisputed Era is something special. We have Shayna Baszler's first TakeOver, and while she hasn't hit her prime yet, the arm-stomping character work is on point. Dream and Cassius Ono have a fun match, and Cole and Black have a very stupid Extreme Rules match featuring men doing things with chairs that should not be done with chairs. However, as good as the rest of it is, it's a one-match show, but what a match, ending with a finished cheap shot from Tommaso Ciampa as a perfect poison cherry on a meat sundae. Number seven, TakeOver Brooklyn 1. Does the first TakeOver Brooklyn feature Canadian destroyers, eight dozen kickouts, and fight forever chance? It does not. Does it feature moments of pure wrestling happiness that have rarely, if ever, been replicated? It sure does. First off, Blue Pants appears and helps the Vorda villains beat Blake and Murphy. Seems quaint to look back on it, but goddamn did this make everyone so happy. If you've forgotten, Blue Pants, aka AEW's librarian Lever Bates, was a comedy jobber who wore blue pants. Adorable. Ignore what happened on the main roster, something you'll have to do when watching this show back, but the Border villains were also over, I promise, and their victory was the first of a number of beam-inducing moments from this show. Samoa Joe wrecked shop against Baron Corbin at the top of his game, Apollo Crews debuted brilliantly, again ignore what came next, and the ladder match between Balor and Owens was also fantastic. Also, bloody hell, what's Jushin Thunder Liger doing in NXT? Wrestling like he's in his 30s, that's what, go Kane the Power Ranger, let's fighting love. But of course, we're here for Sasha Banks versus Bailey, and there's still something in my eye. For any time that people bag on NXT for being predictable, remind them that giving the fans a moment they've prayed for is a good thing. Bailey ascending to the mountaintop and besting Sasha Banks in her prime was just, it just made us all happy. All of us, everyone. And when that curtain call took place, it was thoroughly earned. The story of women's wrestling dominated much of 2015, and looking back, this was the apex of that narrative. Number six, TakeOver Chicago 1. And speaking of feelings, Champa, you godless f so begins probably the best rivalry in NXT history. It's truly an odyssey with twists, turns, injuries, redemptions, wounds being torn open, and this is a nexus point. Well, the seeds had already been planted because Triple H knows what he's doing with Ciampa maybe almost, but not quite turning on Gargano in the Cruiserweight Classic. The team survived only to die another day, and what a death it was. At the end of a great ladder match, the two men stand atop the ramp. You think, will it happen? And then the absolute bastards show up the copyright logo which only appears seconds before the end of the show, so you breathe out, unclench, relax, Champa whispers, this is my moment, and then, and then. It's a perfectly engineered bait and switch, and exactly as vicious as it needed to be. Pats on the back, all round. For this moment alone, Chicago is a significant takeover, but there's also a hell of an undercard here. The women's triple threat is stellar. Both Bobby Roode and Hideo Itami have the greatest match of their NXT careers. Then it was Tyler Bate versus Pete Dunne, one of the great show stealers in takeover history and a wee beauty of a match that sees Tyler Bate's NXT UK Championship run come to an end and the beginning of the history-making Pete Dunne era. A star-making performance from both men, especially Dunne. It helped make this a fully formed great show rather than just a show in service to a great story. After a few underwhelming takeovers with Nakamura, Joe, and Rude never quite managing to fill the space left by Zayn, Balor, and Owens, this was a huge return for the brand. Number five, Takeover Brooklyn 4. Gargano and Ciampa were supposed to blow off the most psychosexual feud of brotherhood, betrayal, and brainwashing to not feature Bray Wyatt and his sweaty kisses at Takeover New York. Don't worry, we'll get to that show. But because God hates next, Tomato Champion went down. So for now, this is the final Champa Gargano singles match 
until Tampa. If that even happens because of that virus, you know, it seems God has something against Champa getting to finish his stories. This is probably the least good of the Champ Gargs, which still makes it better than any match over SummerSlam weekend, but it did also end with Johnny Stupid running into a speaker because his dumb ass can't quite quit Champa. From a storytelling perspective, it's one of the most ambitious long form projects ever, and no amount of slightly deflating finishes can diminish all the callbacks, the repeated imagery, the anger, the nuanced psychological cruelty. Sign me up for another helping. The street fight at Chicago 2 was maybe better, but the undercard is a lot stronger here with the greatest towel based storytelling since Survivor Series 94 and Undisputed Era versus Mustache Mountain, aka the brother shithead versus a proud circus bear and his beautiful son. Velveteen Dream versus EC3 was also a really good WWE star match. Remember when EC3 wrestled? Pepperidge Farm remembers. Also, hey, Kyrie Zane was a great character once because her versus Shayna Baszler is also brilliant. But what really makes the undercard a thing of beauty is the Cole Ricochet match. It's so good to see Ricochet being a thing, Pepperidge Farm, etc. And that spot where Cole nails Ricochet with a super kick as he's upside down, sometimes, just sometimes, everything works out exactly as planned. Number four, TakeOver War Games 2018. The War Games takeovers are just so silly. A silly shoebox filled with silly beef who only barely know why they're killing each other. It's the only time that I think NXT suffers from that debilitating WWE condition of, sorry guys, forget about whatever feuds you've got going on. The calendar says it's stipulation match month. The other two shoebox takeovers are both good, no doubt, but as a whole, 2018 stands head and shoulders above the rest. There isn't a bad match on the card. Cassius Ono ride Matt Riddle's knee all the way to heaven. NXT once again shows why two out of three falls matches is their signature stip with the excellent blow off to Sane Baszler. Sexy Mind Games Prince had a truly star cementing match against Champa, establishing himself as perhaps the greatest character in all of NXT. And Black Gargano stole the show with Johnny proving that his in-ring persona actually gets more engaging with him as a dirtbag. Also, those black masses were an abject cruelty wrapped in holy vengeance vengeance. For twats like me who prefer their matches to have a bit more community theatre than flips, I absolve you of all your sins feels like a present just for me. And then there's the shoebox, and gosh it's silly. The Viking experience team with Captain Bounce and Billy Fingers versus the twat street boys. Why not? I guess. It is November after all. It's just... And then... God, there's a lot. There's so much in it. 45 minutes of seemingly endless spots with a nice sprinkling of story with Undisputed Era locking Dunn inside his cage so he can't enter the match. Seeing as it's what war games seem designed for, let's just rattle off some spots. Ricochet leaping from one ring to the next. That great shot of both teams standing in each ring recreating the Civil War poster. Possibly the beefiest Tower of Doom spot in all of wrestling. And then, of course, Ricochet proving what a f***ing valuable commodity he is with the double moonsault off the top of the cage. What a stupid thing to cap off a very stupid but very great takeover. Number three, Takeover Dallas. Look, I get it. A lot of you would not rank Dallas quite this high, but honestly, this might be my personal favorite takeover. More than any other show NXT has done, this one felt like a card filled with actual living, breathing superheroes. NXT has a lot of indie wrestlers who almost feel anti-WWE because their only quote gimmick is, I'm a very good wrestler. But people don't give NXT nearly enough credit for it being a showcase of the best qualities of WWE, the showmanship, and how that elevates characters to something else, monsters, gods, and demons. I will always like my NXT hyper move style cut with WWE camp. It's the best of both wrestling worlds and Dallas is that combination at its best. Baron Corbin coming to the ring with skulls on his shoulders. American Alpha finally becoming Super Saiyan nerd. Asuka killing our hero because Bailey is a person and Asuka is a goddess of performing brain surgery with her f***ing feet. Finn Balor going Texas Chainsaw Massacre on Samoa Joe. It's excellent wrestling and near mythic visuals. And then we get to Nakamura versus Zayn the most special moment of a most special night. It's genuinely, from every single standpoint, perfect. The anticipation of the crowd. Nakamura appearing in silhouette before that note slides like a knife on skin to reveal the man who set New Japan aflame. Sami Zayn getting the best possible swan song in a promotion that had been built partly on his back. It's the end of his era. That bit where they're just punching each other for ages. I know it's not a perfect show. There's ref stoppages for blood. The Baron Corbin match isn't quite as epic, but this all means nothing. It's a sentimental choice, but bloody hell, I'd make Dallas number one if I could. Number two, Takeover New Orleans. I went around and around with this one 
I really did. I wasn't sure if this should be number one. I just, the top two takeovers are perfect shows. They are from top to toe. There's literally nothing wrong with either of them. So, hey, if this is your favorite, I want you to know that I understand and I'm here for you. It features not one, but two goddamn Wrestling Observer five-star matches in the ladder match for the North American Championship and the first and so far best singles match in the Gargano Champa feud. Everything was great. Shayna Baszler became NXT Women's Champion for the first time and beast moded her shoulder back into its socket to show that yes, she gets pro wrestling. She's going to be great. Roderick Strong shocked the world and I guess the system by joining the Undisputed Era and being the final Chaos Emerald needed to make that group supersonic. Alistair Black was crowned NXT Champion and actually smiled. We caught you. We got you on tape. That match was another notch in the increasingly crowded bedpost of Andrade's accomplishments and then the main event. So it depends what you want from your wrestling, but I think it might be the best main event in TakeOver history, certainly from a storytelling standpoint. All the seeds blossom here. The crutch, the leg brace, each man going back to their DIY finisher, them sitting side by side, just like they did at the Cruiserweight Classic brothers, worn down, destroyed, nothing left but each other. And then Champa completely shits any shot at redemption up the wall, thereby sealing his own destruction. Just yes to all of it. And number one, TakeOver New York. For a whole bunch of other people, this has the greatest main event in TakeOver history. And honestly, let's just take a moment to appreciate how lucky we are that NXT exists. It justifies the existence of WWE artistically almost by itself. It is the king of wrestling. If there's only one thing that puts New York over New Orleans, and by this naming trend, TakeOver's New Jersey, New Mexico, and New Hampshire are bound to be full big boy trousers, is that maybe the ladder match at New Orleans was too good and hurt the matches that followed. Here, however, through some chemical magic, every match manages to compel the crowd and deliver in a big way. The Viking experience versus The Undertaker's grumpy teenager and kid flips was off the hook and generated that warm thank you feeling as both Black and Ricochet left to become a man trapped in a room and a man trapped in Vince McMahon's scorn, respectively. Velveteen Dream wrestles Matt Riddle in what is an absolute dream match from both a character and style perspective. It's the purest WWE style performer versus the purest MMA style performer, and both of them are big, silly characters who add immeasurably to the camp and demented personality of the brand. Also, the meta joy of knowing that by winning, Dream gets to grow and shine even when confronted with the hottest, newest prospect is such a deserved reward for everything he does. Then fucking hell, Walter and Pete Dunne. Sweet Jesus, the chops, the big hands of the big man. Walter is like a bank manager who's gone off the fucking deep end, strips down to his pants and runs screaming into a car park to fight all the cars. Then you get Baszler versus Belair versus Zayn versus Shirai and just how much more is there left to say? Listen the names is all the endorsement I can give without crashing thesaurus.com by spam refreshing the page for love. And then Johnny Gargano and Adam Cole wrestle for 40 minutes, with Gargano going in as the unofficial heel because it was, quote, Adam Cole's time, and turning it around so the fans were more rabid for him than possibly in his entire career by the end. Is it a bit much? Yes. Does it have too many kickouts? probably, but it stands as the culmination of Johnny Gargano's journey that after everything had been taken from him, DIY, his health, his sanity, even the ultimate revenge against Champa, he doesn't have anything left but the NXT Championship. And somehow on that night, that makes him invulnerable and it makes sense. When he finally reaches the top, it's just joy. What a show. Look at all of these shows. I just, and that's our list. Did we miss your favorite takeover? Let us know in the comments. Make sure you subscribe to Wrestle Talk for more lists and news. And it's Sunday, which means over at Parts Fun Known, we'll be airing No Rolls Barred. So make sure you subscribe to that so you know exactly when it drops.